ready tonight. I'm ready to start <coughs> Revelation chapter 15. Finally, we were getting into that tonight. What is 15 about? We'll, we'll get into it. Let's, let's look, at, look into it right now. <coughs> Revelation chapter 15 and also chapter 16. We're going to be talking and discussing about the seven angels with the seven plagues. And there's vials or bowls is also what they're considered. And that's the same thing, the plagues. It's talking about seven, it's a very serious thing. Some of you kind of have already, um, we've talked about it in another uh, class, Sunday mornings. And it's the same concept here, but um, this is Wednesday night Bible study. So the plagues, or in other words, the wrath of God, are found in Revelation 5, chapter, chapter 15 and verse 1 begins. Before John wrote, he saw things in heaven, and the scripture says, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels. Having the seven last plagues. The word last really it's meaning final. So, you know, since the beginning of time with Adam and Eve and all these generations since then, it will become the last at the end. It's going to be the final. Seven last plagues. And so what is it about? Well, continuing with the scripture, for in them is filled up with the wrath of God. You can kind of envision it's something boiling, a pot boiling on a stove. Okay? And the angels here in this vision, uh, someone's vision that they drew, angels are carrying bowls, and they're ready to be poured out. There'll be a new kingdom and a new heaven, or a new, new earth and a new, new heaven. Once the wrath of God has been completed, it's a little bit of commentary let you know I'm, I'm not exactly specifically sure uh, about the three main categories it's a little vague some some of it I've been studying I've tried to get a little more in depth through each chapter and I'm trying to find more infor information and we're gonna hold off on that continuing in verse 2 John continues to speak and I saw as it were a sea of glass. It wasn't like an ocean or, you know, waves splattering like, you know, water, but it was like flat, like a mirror. Mingled with fire. You don't see fire in the middle of this picture, but you see fire around those that are holding the harps. But it appears to be like a sea. And it says in the scripture, a sea of glass. And them, really it's, you know, the followers who, you know, of Jesus Christ, the redeemed, or those that were martyred in the tribulation. Those who refuse to accept the mark, those who refuse to accept the name of the Antichrist or to worship him and the beast and Satan. Continuing of scripture, that had gotten the victory over the beast. Really, they truly suffered. They were harmed, they were 
hurt. They were tried to be forced to bow down and, and, and to worship and to accept it. But they refused. And there are those who have died. But those are the ones who have received the victory. They won. Antichrist thinks he's won, but he's lost. He didn't win their soul. He didn't win them. They actually won the victory over him. Continuing, and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on talking about those who follow Christ. Okay, if you notice the commas and reference in the written language, it's referencing those who followed Christ, those who were redeemed, those who had been martyred in the tribulation. It says, <coughs> and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. <coughs> Continuing with verse 3. And the followers with the harps of God. Okay? And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God. And the song of the Lamb, saying, <coughs> Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just, meaning he's equitable, he's fair, he's just. Just and true are thy ways, thou king of saints. They're singing and worshiping God. Did you like the picture? Uh oh, what happened here? Missed that order. The bit commentary says these people who were victorious over the mark right here those are those that are, are victorious they won they were victorious over the mark and are singing the song of the lamb Jesus Christ continuing with Revelation 15 and 4 it tells us who shall fear thee? O Lord, and glorify thy name. For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee. For thy judgments are made manifest. So they've continued singing and praising. So manifest, they were born. Or talking about Christ, he was born. And he was made flesh. It says, for thou only... There's not three persons here. Only means one. For thou, thou is one, art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee. For thy judgments are made manifest. This is Jesus. God is Jesus. Before Jesus was born, before he was made manifest, God had not become manifest in a flesh, meaning the example of Christ. So you could not see Christ. He would form in you know, a cloud or whatnot. But when Jesus was born, he was God. 
He was manifest in flesh, Jesus Christ. And he was God on earth. That's what this is saying. He was man made manifest. Before, before Jesus came, it was, he was a spirit. He was an invisible God. And then here Jesus was born. He was God manifest in the flesh. It says only. Thou only. One. Thou only. You are holy. If it was the, T-H-E-E, it would be many. But it says thou. T-H-O-U. Thou. It means one. Only. Very clear, very clear. Some people believe there's, you know, three. No. Right here, Revelation 15, 4, talking one. I already said this, only one is holy, the Lord God Almighty, Revelation 15, 5 and 6. John is continuing here. And after that, I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened so he was looking they were continuing with the t with the harps playing and he looked and beheld the temple the tabernacle and the testimony in heaven was opened the testimony the tabernacle of the testimony was opened verse 6 and the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues. So the angels are coming, seven of them, holding the vials or the bowls with the plagues inside. It says, clothed in pure and white linen and having their breasts girded. Okay, so... Their linen was girded. It was fastened with a belt. It said, with golden girdles. Okay, so there it is, the golden girdle. So they were tied down. It was tied down. It really it reminds me, you know, when Jesus, he has... Jesus will have the same thing. It's interesting. So in heaven, will they have that? Is that... Is that the attire that they wear? It made me wonder. It made me envision thinking about it. You know, some angels would have six wings. Some would have four. Some, I don't know, it doesn't say. And it's specific with white and this gold girdle. Huh, it's just different. Different uh, descriptions throughout the Bible there. But what John saw, he noticed, he saw seven angels. He noticed they were the people with the harps, and he noticed the tabernacle, and as the angels came out, how they were dressed and they were attired. There, it's opening here. They're coming through. It doesn't say their steps in the scripture, but it says they come out. Okay. So just a little commentary. In the Bible, the scripture, it's not very clear. It's not known every detail about the temple in heaven, but, you know, it's not specific for every little detail, but there is to be a heavenly temple and an earthly temple. Okay? There's the difference. There's a heaven temple and an earthly temple. All right, the seven angels come out of the heavenly temple, carrying the plagues of God's wrath. Let's look at verse 7 and 8 of chapter 15. And one of the four beasts, it's referenced as angels. Let's, uh, if we look back in Revelation chapter 4, there's verses 6 through 8 it's talking about uh, the angels having a face as a man. 
lion, calf, and flying eagle with six wings. Okay. So it says four beasts. So it kind of you go back and you know Revelation chapter four. Continuing with verse seven here. It says, gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. It wasn't half. It wasn't three quarters. It wasn't just a little bit in there. It says full. Talking about God who lives forever and ever. He'll never pass away. It's forever, eternal. Verse 8. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God. Okay, the temple. When I saw that, I'm like, oh, the God's there. The glory of God. Uh huh, it's God. It says the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. So really what this means is I read this, my understanding is John, he looked, he saw, noticed at the temple there were seven angels, they were coming out. He looked, he saw four angels, they gave the seven angels the vials or the, the bowls with the wrath of God. There was the temple and it was smoke filled and the glory of God was there. Everyone, they could not, no one could enter in because first the seven angels must finish with the pouring out of the vials. Once that's finished, it says they could not enter until <coughs> when the seven angels came out, the door would close. No one would be able to enter. The angels must finish their responsibility of pouring out. So in chapter 16, we'll continue talking about what happens with each angel. I think it's, I think it's the fifth angel. It's talking about the Battle of Armageddon. We'll show you when we get to that. It's very clear. So before then, you know, one through five, it seems, or one through four, it seems that that's before the Armageddon. But um, I'm going to hold off on that. I want to be very clear. Let's, let's just stay with the scripture. All right, again, it says, um, as the angels begin to pour out the contents of the vials, no one can enter a heaven's temple. And the Bible teaches us that right now we can come boldly into the holy place. It's possible that once the vials start being poured out, no one else will be able to be saved. No one will be able to enter that temple until the plagues are finished. So right here, as I read this and I was studying this, it made sense to me. It's kind of hard to explain. It's not literal. The point may be made here, and let me give you an example. Like as of today, we, we preach, you must, you must obey Acts 2.38. It says, repent. Peter, he was preaching. And they asked him, what do we do? He says, repent, repent. No more making mistakes. Look to God. Change your ways. The bad things, the sin you're involved in, stop. Accept the fact and believe, turn to God and follow him. 
You've got to be baptized. In water, immersion in water, fully immersed, in the name of Jesus Christ. It's a must. And why is that? Why do we, why are we baptized? To remove the sins and toss them out. So you've got to believe, you've got to repent, you've got to be baptized in the name of Jesus, and the last thing, you get the Holy Ghost. Right here. It's very clear right here. So if I follow each step, and then I raise my hands, how am I going to, how am I going to connect with the Lord? How am I going to open up myself? Once you open it up, the Holy Ghost is going to come in. That's the Holy Ghost. That's opening up the temple, right? You're opening up the temple. You're the temple right now. And he can he can enter in. He connects with you. You can enter in there. You can enter in, his, in, in the presence of God. Right? Does that make sense? And you say, Acts 2.38, oh, no, 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 do it later, do it later. No, not for now. No, not right now. Let's wait. Let's be patient. <clears throat> you know, wait till I get old enough. And, oh, no, no, not for now. What if they die? It's too late. Just giving you an example. Oh, just put it off. Whoa, wait a minute. The temple is open now. Come. It's your opportunity. The door is open. Are you going to reject? You're going to say no? Well, okay. I don't know how long the door is going to stay open. It's your choice. You know the Holy Ghost is ready to come in. Do you believe? You want to join? You want to come in? Oh, yeah, the Holy Ghost is for you. Great. And people connect and they unify with the Lord. And they, but then there's others who are like, no, it's not for me. And they reject him. Okay, well, the door is open for you. It's ready. Come on in. The mercy is here for you. And people just say, well, no, not for me. It's not the right time. And then when the, when the call comes for those angels to come out, the door is going to slam shut. And the vials will be poured out. And it's the wrath of God. Very serious. <clears throat> People are going to say, oh, I repent, God. I'm so sorry. Oh, it's too late. It's too late. <clears throat> and no man was able to enter into the temple. If you don't have the Holy Ghost, when the wrath is poured out, it's too late. Oh, but God, oh, so pray with me. I want the Holy Ghost now, God. Oh, my God. But nothing. You feel nothing. There's nothing there. The temple, the doors are shut. It's closed. The gift no longer is given out. It's over. It's done. The door's shut. Wow. Now. Grab the time now. Don't wait. Don't wait till those angels come out. It's over. The doors are shut. You won't be able to enter in. Very clear. Revelation 15, 7 and 8. Moving along. We're looking at Revelation 22 and verse 11. It says... He that is unjust, could be anyone, any unrighteous person. They're not righteous. They've not, they're not holy. You know, they're wanderers. They're full of sin. Let him be unjust still, but he continues. Let him be. And he which is filthy, full of sin, unholy, they can't touch the holiness. No. It says, let him be filthy still. <clears throat> be on their own. That's their decision. And he that is righteous prays, studies, avoids sin, asks for forgiveness for wrong that's taken place. Let him be righteous still. Chosen God. Chosen to obey the law. Chosen to obey him. 
and he that is holy, let him be holy still. God is holy. You must be holy to be in communion with him. Revelation 22, 11. It's everyone's choice. It's your choice. You want to stay like you are? Stay dirty, stay sinful? That's your choice. No one's going to twist your arm. No one's going to force you. I'm not. I'm just sharing the word with you. I'm sharing the wording from the word of God. And you say, no, not for me. Okay, it's your choice. I get it. It's up to you. I'm moving along. For me, oh, I've decided. I know what the Word of God says. I'm going to follow Christ. I'm not. I, I, I'm going to stay as close to Him as I can. I, I got to stay holy. I got to follow Him. It's my choice. I'm going to follow Him. I'm going to stay holy as best I can. Someone else? They going to blow the Lord off? They going to do their own thing? You know, they want a good time, enjoy life. Oh. When's the time of the Lord coming? When's the temple going to shut? You're going to be too late? Well, everyone on their own, that's your choice. Revelation 22, 11. Let's keep going. It's, wow, it's 8, 11. I thought I had to stop, but no. We're going to keep going. Chapter 16, we're going to get into tonight. Really, chapter 16, uh, backing up chapter 15, they had, you know, the, the seven angels. But here in, in Revelation 16, it's going to go in explanation of what is in each, each bowl or each vial. So John again. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying so the door is open John heard a voice a great voice God's voice talking to the seven angels saying go your ways I've told you what to do you have a job to do go do it do it now go you know your responsibility, go. That's what it's saying. Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. It's God's wrath. He's commanded the angels to go. And they agree, they obey, and there they go. Where are they going to go? Go your ways, oh, upon the earth. Down there on the earth, right there. Specifically, there's a specific place, a specific reason for each vial. Wow, wrath of God. Woo. The first vial. We're going to look at the first five vials in this lesson, described in Revelation 16:2. Talking about the angels. There's seven. Sorry, right here are my, my fingers. Okay, here comes seven angels. God tells them, go do your job. So one angel went. All right, the first. The first went and poured out his vial upon the earth. And there fell a noisome. And this word means it's like a bad odor, foul, a very unpleasant, uh, it's just very intolerable. Like when I got out of the vehicle tonight, it was like there's a sewer smell out back. It's the, it's, you know, country, it's, it's kind of country tank, but it, it smells, you can smell it, you know, sifting through the air, but here, right here it's talking noise and it's so unpleasant, it's intolerable, all right? And grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast. So they're gonna have sores, it's gonna be very painful. 
and they're the ones who accepted the mark. And upon them which worshipped his image. So not only accepted the mark, but they worshipped him. Talking about the Antichrist or the beast. And this is just an image of someone's drawing of what they see it's going to be like. It looks like boils and sores all over their bodies. And they're in pain. And down in the lower part of the screen, it's like a smoky stench, okay? It's just in pain. It's just intolerable. Now I'm just telling you, don't accept the mark of the beast. Don't worship the Antichrist. God's emphasizing here that you do, okay, this is, this is the wrath that's going to be poured out. It's going to be part of you. The angel's going to be ordered. Go pour, it, go pour out the wrath. All right, well, they, they didn't accept me. All right, they get the wrath. This commentary, one thing I noticed here, it says the vials of the wrath will not be poured out until after the mark of the beast has been implemented. So three and a half years, you have seven years total, great tribulation, three and a half, and then the middle, the Antichrist should appear. And somewhere in there, after that, will be the mark of the beast, 666. And those people that will accept it and worship. It'll happen during the three and a half years called the Great Tribulation. And the Antichrist consolidates his power. He combines it to make it one single effect. Very powerful. And squeezes his hold upon humanity to control them. And things will become progressively worse. So the vials of wrath is going to be poured out and life is just going to be torture. The second vial. All right, verse 3. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. So the living things that lived in the sea becomes dead. They die. Fish, um, different, uh, like shrimp and lobster and crabs and... Oh. Uh, the jellyfish, everything that's in, in the body of water will die. It says, died in the sea. 100% of the water? Is that going to be all over the earth? I don't, I don't know. It's like, it's just, just imagine. Everywhere, like the red, you know, water is like, can you imagine like on, on the map or on the globe where water is, it's going to turn red and, you know, it used to be you know, marked green and, and water would be blue and just, it was just beautiful, but when the wrath of God's poured out, the beauty's going to be gone. It's going to change. It's going to become horrible. It's going to be ugly. It, it, it will. The red is, is, is going to be disgusting. You going to come back on earth? No, not me. I'm going to stay there. Space. This may refer to a massive war that will pollute the oceans. But it's not certain. We can only speculate on what this will be. Since every living soul dies in the sea, it may be describing an environmental disaster. So whatever lived in that water will die. 
So some sort of destruction will take place. You know, the food's going to be gone. The food source and the water's going to be gone. It'll be contaminated. All, all sources of water and uh, I, I don't know what they, shellfish and so forth, it's all going to be gone. The third vial, Revelation 16, 4 through 7. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. So fountains, you know, could be, you know, our faucets, where we get our water from, the sources. it becomes blood I'm just going to share something with you one or two well uh, maybe close to ten years ago I wasn't studying Revelation I didn't know in detail I heard people talk about it and you know they were like oh you got to buy a food source and be ready for uh, you know the end time and, and like if, if food became you know For example, like if we had a tornado and there was just a disaster, we wouldn't have food or water. So you need to, you know, store, you know, provisions for yourself. So I would do that. I would, you know, buy water and I'd circulate. I would make sure that I had a continuous amount because you can't leave the same water for like 25 years. You just, you have to re, you know, re, resupply it, use it up and, and put more back. So maybe I have about six or seven, you know, 24 packs you know our, our family we, we drink it when we need to you know we'd have enough if we need to if we had an emergency now some people I heard them talking about it, they're like I've already bought a, a storage amount that'll last for 25 years and I looked at them and I'm like what you have enough that'll last I can't imagine I'm thinking about if the wrath of God could take place, I'd have enough water. It'd be protected. But the more I study, you can't escape the wrath of God. For example, the water bottles, I believe they'll uh. become, obviously they'll come become blood. The rivers and the waters, oh they're bad, but we got the water here, and they go down to go look. And it's all red. Because no one can escape the wrath of God. So explain that to me. If you if you ration food and you're like, you know, I, I, I've, I've already, I've eaten you, God. I've got enough to supply myself. But God, you can't out, out beat God. When he says all water sources become blood, there's not going to be any that's left without his touch. The 144,000, they will be provisioned for. They're in hiding, and God will have provisions for them. It's the word of God. But they'll be in hiding. But others will be crying out what you know for their needs, and the bottled water is no good. They'll be thirsty. They'll be they'll be crying out. Pray and trust God. But God, what if it wasn't, you know, you ignore God now, he's not, he's not going to provide for you. Be ready and say, God, I love you and I'm praying every day. I want you to be with me. I want to be with you. I want to be obedient. And he will provide. He will take care of you in your time of need. He'll lead you to the right place. God has a plan for everything. Just be faithful. But those that are like playing around with God, oh, you know, I'm ready. Bring it on. No, God knows. He knows your heart. He knows if you're playing a game or not. So I 
just believe, I'm very serious. I thought, oh, you know, we'd have, you know, be able to stock up, but no. The more I study this, we've got to trust God. We have to be faithful to Him. God will give provisions there, and the woman will, uh, that's, that really means the 144,000. They'll be in protection. They'll be in hiding. Uh, but all others, they won't. Those who have, you know, a relationship with God, God will, you know, take care of them, I believe. Here in Revelation 16, 5, John is continuing here and says, And I heard the angel of the waters. Wait, wait a minute, let me, let me check something. Yeah, that's the third vial. So this is the third angel, okay? It says, And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and was and shall be, because thou hast judged thus, meaning these. So thou art righteous, O Lord, which are, which was, and shall be, because thou hast judged these. Talking about these people. You've given me this vial. You are holy, God. You are righteous. My job, you tell me to, to pour it out. You said judgment. You pour it, okay, I pour it out. Those who rejected you. Verse 6, continuing, For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets. So they've martyred people, they've killed them, they've tortured them, so forth. And thou hast given them blood. To drink. So these, these that have worshipped the image of the beast, they've, they've tortured, they've shed the blood of the saints. It says, for they are worthy, meaning they are getting their due reward. Let me explain something. For an example, I'm a, I'm a person and I accept, if I would accept the mark of the beast and I would worship the Antichrist, if, and he orders me, to do something against the Christians because they follow God. So I would follow them. I would, you know, if I'm in the army and I'm like, they follow Jesus Christ, so I'm I'm gonna capture them and you know I'm gonna kill them and I'm gonna martyr them and their blood, the Antichrist. They say, great job, you've done great, you've, you've, they've died, awesome. And the people that follow the Antichrist, they're like, okay, good, we did good, we made him proud. And they search for more. And they search for more to capture, okay? That's the picture. Now, they've killed them all. Their blood has been shed because they belong to Christ. Now what? What is my reward? because of what I just did. It says, and thou hast given them blood to drink. Meaning, they shed the blood of the Christians, those who followed Christ, so their reward is the blood to drink. In other words, the reward they have 
tortured God's people. Like blood for blood. You killed them, now it's your turn, you die. You give up your blood. You accepted the Antichrist, you accepted the mark. You've, you've spilled the blood of my people. So now, blood is on your hands, so now you give your blood. Oh boy, wow. I'm just giving you a warning. Don't mess with God and his people. If you're God's people and somebody messes with you, they don't follow Christ. Oh, they're on dangerous grounds. Don't. I'm going to give you a story. So one man named Malloy, you know, Brother Richmond, he lives in Mississippi, I believe. He posted a question and said, who brought the Ark of the Covenant back to Israel? And so me, it forced me to get into the Word and really go studying, and I found it's a, a man of some, you know, area, the name. And I went back up, and I think it was 1 Samuel chapter 6, six or seven, and as I was reading this, I kept reading and reading, I was amazed. Those people in the Palestine, they were at war against Israel and the people. They have, they have captured them and they stole the Ark of the Covenant. They stole it. And they brought it somewhere into the city there was like three different cities but they brought it and they were celebrating they thought oh it's a trophy like it's like it's ours oh look how beautiful it is and they were just but you know what happened i think some you know developed a disease and they got sick and they died why that's the ark of the covenant and it brought they brought it there and people were like oh we don't want to touch it we don't want to bring it to the city because people became sick in the other parts of the city, right? It was bad. They kept bringing it. They didn't know what to do with it. They were like, we don't want it. We don't want it. That's God's ark. That's his. We don't want to get away from us. We don't want to touch it. We don't want to be involved in it. So they put it on uh, cows to carry. There was a specific group that brought back to Israel. Now give me the same vision here. You mess with God and his holiness, his holy things, it will cause sickness to come upon you. Like same thing, you kill God's people, it will come back to you. Here it's over. Oh my, don't mess with God. Does that make sense to you? That's a story that just made me think of that. It's like, wow. You know, honor God, respect God, obey Him. What's holy, keep it holy, follow Him. Those who criticize and persecute against you, be patient. God knows, He sees what you're going through, and He's taking note. He knows. You know the story of Saul? He killed, right? He killed Christians. Those that followed Jesus, the one time He was riding. You no, know, he wasn't. The scripture didn't say he was riding. He was walking. Okay, so he was walking, and you know the, those following behind him. And suddenly, yes, he was on to Damascus. The closer he got, God struck him. Why are you persecuting me? And Saul was like, "What? Who? Who? Who am I, Lord? Who am I?" He realized, "Oh, that Jesus." He was shocked, and it changed him. And he changed his name from Saul to Paul because he realized he, he had the revelation of Jesus Christ and who he is. He says, why are you persecuting me? Because you're persecuting my people. You're killing my people. Oh, he was amazed. This is very clear. Very clear.
Yeah, I need to stop here. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll begin the fourth file two weeks. Two weeks. Because next Wednesday, no class. All right? God bless. Let's pray before we go home. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We've been together once again, studying your word. We pray, Lord, that we continue the anointing. Help me to teach. Help me to study and understand those that are hungry for your word, Lord, that they, they would receive it. Protect those going home tonight. We pray for those that, you know, witness to and they would share the gospel and those who would accept the gospel. And, and Lord, be, be prepared that the tabernacle doors won't shut on them, but that they will commit. They would receive the Holy Ghost as it's poured out. Lord, touch people. Lord, we pray to continue witnessing. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.